It's often said that the world is a big place. And yet, the internet has this uncanny ability to make it a really, really small place. Every day, we might be conversing with users anywhere in the world. They might be your next door neighbor. They could literally be half a world away. Often, you wouldn't even know. You know from an altruistic point of view, you know, it's nice to say, oh yeah, we should make our applications usable by as many people as possible, regardless of whether they're in the UK or Europe or you know, China or wherever else. More realistically though, commercially, it's often an imperative. So that's what we're gonna talk about. Uh, just before I go on, you know, I'd just like to say thank you to the organizers and the volunteers. Um, I think this is my fourth or fifth PHP UK. I've kind of lost count. Every year they do a fantastic job. Um, you know, Joe, Sam, the volunteers, the AV crews, you know, and it, this conference wouldn't be what it is w without those people. So, you know, from myself, you know, thanks to those guys. So, my name's Liam Wiltshire. Um, it says there, I'm a senior PHP developer and business manager. So, hands up who hates salespeople? Yeah, I get to hate myself. Um, because business manager is basically glorified ringing people and trying to sell them enterprise. But there we go, it's fine. And I work for this company called Tebex. Uh, now, you've probably not heard of us, we're a, a fairly small company, but effectively we run um, a SaaS g-commerce platform for sandbox games, such as that one. It's Minecraft, which is awesome, because my kids think it's great, because I get to speak to these YouTubers and stuff, and I have no idea who they are. And yeah, it's like, oh, you spoke to this guy. It's like, yeah, he's a customer. <laughs> but they think it's awesome. So I've been cool. For the last 18 months, I've been cool for the first time in my life. <laughs> now, that would probably make a good company logo. I know, Global Express Shipping or something. But actually, as I said, the world is a big place. But all the while, internet access is growing worldwide. You know, in all corners of the globe, not that globes have corners, um, you know, there are massively expanding markets that are opening up, and they are opportunities for anyone who is selling a service or a product, or whatever that might be, on the internet. Now, most of these do not use English as their mother tongue. Yes, you could say, well, a fair number of people probably do speak English. Firstly, that is a horrible assumption to make. Secondly, it's not true. Yes, you know, there are, of course, there are English speakers you know, same as, well, I, I speak a, a tiny bit of French. Um, and, you know, a lot of French people speak far better English than I do French. I mean, that's just a fact. But there are also plenty of people that, you know, don't speak English, you know, hardly at all. And certainly if you're talking something technical, it wouldn't be accessible to those people. So you're missing that opportunity. Um, I've pulled up some statistics. Now, these are to do with the, the digital gaming industry, because that's what we do. Um, but you can find very similar numbers for, for anything. Now, the global digital games market is now worth over $100 billion a year. That's an obscene amount of money. A lot of that you know, is, is mobile gaming. Now, Minecraft has a mobile gaming uh, version, and we take advantage of that as well. Um, and previously, it would have been the case that you know, most digital spend was in Europe and North America. These days, it's not even half. You know, China spends more on digital gaming than the USA. So why would you not want to take advantage of that market? You know, and you know, equally in China, as it says there, secondary sales, so that's not buying the game itself, that's buying power-ups or add-ons or extra lives or, or you know, the sorts of things that we sell, um, counts for 88% of their market. So of that over half of the, you know, the, the global market they have, 88% of that is secondary sales. So that makes a lot of sense. So before we go on, obviously the, the title of the talk has you know, a, letter, a letter I and the number 18 and the letter N in it. So let's talk about what that means. Internationalization. Now this is a uh, quote that I stole from, I think, Wikipedia. Should have put the source on there, I'm sorry. Um, that says, internationalization is the process, or the concept of the process, to make an application international. That is, to make it support, or make it able to support virtually any language or local setting on Earth, or maybe one day on Mars. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? 
there's another term that often is used alongside and can be confused with. And that's, that's, that's a lowercase l, not capital I, because that'd be really confusing. Um, L10n, which is localization. Now that's the process, or apparently the concept of the process again, to make an application localized, which is to say it works for a given local and concrete context. So the easier way of saying this is that localization is taking what you have and going, right, I'm going to make it work for insert locale here. Whereas internationalization is providing a framework or a way of localizing without, in this example, us having to get involved every time. So we don't want to have to get involved every time someone wants to localize it for China or for Vietnam or for you know, Brazil or whatever else. We don't want to have to get involved every single time that happens. We just want to provide a framework to allow people to do this. Um, I've already mentioned I work for Bycraft. This isn't a Bycraft pitch particularly, so very briefly what we do. Um, we are a G-commerce platform, as I mentioned, for sandbox games. Predominantly at the moment, that's Minecraft. However, we are in the process of working with a couple of studios to actually integrate the platform into some upcoming games, which is why more, now more than ever, this is an important thing for us. We operate a SaaS platform, as I mentioned. Um, normally, if I'm talking to non-technical people, I describe it as Shopify for Minecraft, because it's about the only way you can get people to understand what we do. Um, so we do that. We are global. Uh, we serve about just over half a million web stores, um, and the actual web store owners come from it's slightly more than that now. It's about 174 odd different countries, and then those web stores combined, we've handled over 16 million payments from 255 countries. Um, so, you know, quite obviously, being able to support different locales, different languages, that sort of thing, is important to us. So, we al we've always had some form of language support. Um, this isn't the current solution anymore, but this is kind of where we were. So we had a limited range of languages. Uh, I think there was about 12. And when you went to a web store, you could pick one of those languages. And then we had a centralized list of translations that were just PHP arrays. That's it. So you would have title.username, which I think in English was something like, to access this web store, please provide your username. Um, and that's it. And then there was a lang function that you could use in your templates, and you provided the shortcode, and assuming the translation existed, it would then display. This wasn't very good. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad, because if I could go, well, that's perfect, thank you, and good night, this would be a very short talk. Uh, thankfully for me, there are some problems with it. Um, first of all, we had a restricted language set. Now, just as a complete aside, if you don't know these XKCD comics, they're brilliant. Do check them out. I use them a lot. Um, we had a restricted language set. And what I mean by that is that because the language lists were centralized, if we, as in Tebex, hadn't provided a translation for it, you couldn't use it. So we had people writing from you know, um, Estonia, for example, was one going, oh, can we have an Estonian translation? Well, kind of no. There isn't one. And we would get around to getting one done eventually, but it took, you know, it took time and we didn't get them done, unfortunately. And we've had issues in the past where we've outsourced translations and someone said, well, look, I've done these translations for you. We've loaded them up into a, an array and gone, there you go, you look, new language. And someone like a week later pointed out that one of the translations basically went, you buy craft. And obviously we didn't know because we couldn't check them because we didn't speak the language. So that wasn't great. <laughs> the second problem was that it only supports default strings. Um, so as you saw, they were a centralized array, and we had a short code and a translation. Well, if you created your own web store templates, which you could do, you might have strings that aren't in our default language pack. You might have changed the wording for that, you know, provide your username to log in message. Well, if that's the case, tough, you can't translate it you were stuck with whatever string you'd entered. That, again, meant that you ended up with mishmashes because you'd have stores where, for some places, they're perhaps they were using the default strings, some places they'd written their own. And so if I put it into, say, Dutch, some stuff would come up in English because it couldn't find a translation. 
other stuff would then be translated into Dutch, which is probably almost worse in a, in a weird way. So that wasn't ideal. And there was a high maintenance cost. Um, every time we added a new feature that changed the web store templates, we'd probably add a new string. So for example, recently we've added a gift card feature. Now, we now have to go through every single language and translate, you know, if you have a gift card, provide your number here, into all the languages that we support. Which I'm embarrassed to say often didn't happen. So there are strings that even we provided that there aren't translations for. And again, if it did happen, it was probably delayed. And we could only guess at how accurate the translations were. So none of these are great. My favorite slide. Uh, the best trust exercise ever. Except, of course, if they're not going to catch you. Um, we didn't have fallbacks. As, as you saw, there was a, you had a shortcode and a translation. Um, so if I went, OK, well, lang title dot new username, if that translation didn't exist in a given language pack, there wasn't a default it could fall back to. It would just display an empty string. So all these things were, you know, and, and, you know it got, a, got us to this point, but we were looking at this going, we need to do better. We should be doing better. So we decided that we were going to rework all of this. So we set out some aims. Uh, we wanted to produce an internationalization layer that allows users to customize the translations to fit them. In other words, we shouldn't be dictating, this is the translation you will use. They should be able to pick or define their own translations. Um, this should include supporting custom strings. So if, if I've gone, well, I don't like the default wording on the, the web store, I've changed it to this, they should be able to provide translations for that as well. Uh, or in fact, new languages. As I said, we, we could only support a limited subset of languages, but there are hundreds of languages around the world being used. Why can't they provide a language for their web store to suit them? It needs to be fast. We, we, you know, we uh, power a lot of web stores. We don't want a slow solution. And it needs to be easy for non-technical store owners to update. So first of all, we looked at some options. Now, there's one option that's fairly obvious, or was fairly obvious to me anyway, uh, which is Jenny get text. Now, I couldn't really find a witty, comment, uh, witty comic to illustrate the Jenny get text. It's not that funny a a, a thing. So here's a llama. No reasons. It's a llama. Do you get text? Uh, get text is it is a set of tools and libraries to allow developers um, to produce multilingual messaging. That's what it does. Um, it's used by a huge number of uh, server platforms like WordPress. So. Yeah, we went, okay, that's the first thing we're going to look at. There were some good reasons to look at that. It is mature. PHP already has a get text compatible library, although actually a lot of PHP frameworks and CMSs that use get text don't use the PHP library. Never mind. <laughs> um, there are plenty of examples of it in use. Everyone can provide their own translation files. You can create a, a .po file and define your the translations, and great. Um, it's fast because those PO files get uh, compiled down to .mo files, which are machine readable. And it supports plurals. So on the face of it, it ticks a lot of boxes. And we're like, OK, this might actually be our solution. There are some downsides to it, though. First of all, it doesn't support placeholders. Now, what I mean by placeholders is if you're saying something like, are you sure you want to block and then another player name, you don't know what that other player name is. Um, so the way around this with get text is they expect you to use like a, a sprintf function or something similar to then provide those arguments separately and then replace them in. Well, that's fine if you're technical and you understand what that is. But if I'm non-technical, the last thing I want to do is when I create my custom template, to have to go and read a big load of documentation to go, oh, well, what are the placeholders in this string? I, I should just be able to look at the string and know what the placeholders are. I should be able to look at, are you sure you want to block name, and go, oh, that's a name. So that was a problem. And it's lovely. It's not very user friendly. So that's a translation file for get text. Um, there's a load of headers. I, I 
don't know what half of those do. Um, and then you've got these you know, quite elongated sets of, of translations. Now, yeah, don't get me wrong, our server owners are running Minecraft servers. They're not, you know, they're not technically clueless by any shape or form, but this would be very new. This is something that they, they would never have seen before, and for a lot of them would be off-putting. You know, the last thing you want to be doing is dealing with something like that. Yes, you can download additional editors like PO Edit or whatever else to do this for you, but you're, you're introducing barriers that we don't really want. So we kind of looked at it and went, you know, if it was an internal product, if we were selling directly to consumers, then actually this probably would be perfect because we know how this works, we know how to write them, we know how Sprintf works, whatever else, happy days. But because we're not the ones writing the translations, it got crossed off our list. Now, see a nice little Laravel logo? Um, I've not mentioned this, yes, this yet. Our code base is Laravel. Um, so, it made sense to look at, there, look a, at a built-in option. Um, yeah, we use Laravel. There are some bits of it that we don't use, facades. Uh, in fact, can we cut that? Because I want to speak at Laracon EU. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> but it does a good job for our application, and it works well. So, there is a translation package for Laravel. Um, Using the default tools is a good kind of starting point. If you have built-in tools, whatever framework or CMS, whatever you're using, if there is a tool to do a job that's built in, it makes sense to use it, if at all possible, rather than loading in more stuff. Um, so yeah, it's built in. Because it's a Laravel built-in uh, package, lots of Laravel extensions already support it. Um, it's been around since version 4. So it is fairly mature. So yeah, there were some real reasons to use it. It supports plurals. So here's one example here, apples. There is one apple, there are many apples. We have plural support, great. It has readable placeholders. When I realized this, I was basically skipping around the office. You know, goodbye name, well, that's a name. And in actual fact, the way it does it is really clever. So you can change the casing of the placeholder and it'll automatically change the casing of the the string you're injecting in to either make it all uppercase or title case or lowercase, which is pretty cool. Um, and translations are stored as arrays. So it's pretty fast. So at the moment, we're looking good. We were really going, this seems like a really good solution. Then we found some downsides to it. So first of all, the translations are all stored as arrays, very similarly to the way we did it. Um, so that's not very user friendly. You know, again, we're not writing these translations. We're relying on the store owners to write PHP arrays. I can see a problem with that. So, okay. Then also, translations are stored on the file system. Now, we have half a million web stores that could write their own translations. We scale across about 10 to 15 AWS instances. So we're going to have a centralized file system storing possibly five million translations? I'm thinking no, probably not a good idea. But anyway, and also the translation key is still a shortcode, which means you don't have a, a fallback. Now that has, because I, I, I could see, I, I, I saw uh, fake, his eyes went up. That has now been fixed in later versions of Laravel. They are now actually the full strings. We're still running Laravel 5.2, so, that was, uh, that was a bit of a problem. And also, I did look at this plurals, and you know, as much as I was happy that this plural support is here, having a pipe separator, and, and in other cases which we'll come on to, the syntax gets more and more unwieldy to support different plurals. So that was a bit of a question mark. And then, I've already mentioned freak. I'm going to do it again. Uh, I was doing some research and went, hold on. We can store the translations in a database. Uh, Freak's organization did an awesome blog post on writing a custom uh, file, one, one of the services that it uses anyway, to then actually not get them from the file system, but to get them from the DB. So I was like, oh my goodness, this will work. I can make this work. This is going to be awesome. So I can load them from the DB. Awesome. Which now means I can have them written in whatever format I want, because we'll just store them in the DB and then load them back out into an array. Happy days. Um, yeah, great. And you know what? We'll even upgrade to a new version of Laravel. I'm OK with this. We need to anyway. So, we're now winning. 
Except we're not. I thought we were winning. I thought we had the, the solution. But I'd forgotten a few things. Um, and again, if we can cut this bit again so I can get into Laracon, that'd be great. We do use Laravel. We don't use it everywhere. <clears throat> now, some of our web store code is still legacy. I say legacy because I refuse to write the word code ignited too. <laughs> uh, we've all got it. We've all got those little bits and whatever. And there's no guarantee we're always going to use Laravel. What if we decide to write a brand new JS front end and we want the internationalization to happen on the front end? What if you write a mobile app? We want something where we can take the same essential concept and put it anywhere. Now, I would go on a, out on a limb and say, writing your own solution to anything is probably a bad idea. Yeah. So we wrote our own. Um, which, I mean, this, this, is a, this is another good comment, commit strip. If no one reads this, um, I think the guys that, uh, that write these are based in France. They do translations. The screen's not great, so I'll tell you what it says. It says, um, hey, so you found at least 40 open source plugins that would do what we need, right? Yeah. And you can't decide which one would be best for this project. Yeah, it's basically impossible. So at what moment exactly did that crazy brain of yours conclude that the best solution would be to develop plugin 41? But that's what we've done. <laughs> the, I think the, the, where it came to was that we had very specific ideas of how we wanted this to work. Um, and everything else seemed to require a compromise somewhere. And I'm quite a stubborn person, and I don't want to compromise. So we have our requirements. It must support plurals. Um, the key should be the default translation, and it should have readable placeholders. It needs to be, we need to be able to have it overwritten and customized on a per-user basis in a format that our store owners can understand. It needs to support languages that we don't even know exist. And we should be able to load the translations into arrays for speed. Um, which basically means what we did is we went, right, what do we like from get text? What do we like from Illuminate Translation? And mashed it together. Now, you probably noticed that one of my top hit list things has always been plurals. I was incredibly naive about plurals, embarrassingly naive about plurals. I had kind of always just taken them for granted. Even though actually, you know, from speaking a small amount of French, I knew that actually there were differences. I just always went, oh, well, it's an apple, two apples, 59 bajillion apples. You know, that's, that, that's it, right? No. So the plural rules that I know of, that can be only one form. So some languages, mainly Asian languages like Japanese, Korean, have no plural. It's the same form regardless. Um, some of them have two forms, where the singular is only used for the count of one. So that's like English. You have no apples or two apples, but you have one apple. Some have the two forms, but actually the singular version is used for zero and one, such as French, and some forms of Portuguese, I think. Um, there are three forms, three forms with different special cases, three forms where you have a special case if it ends in zero, zero. So 100 is a different to 99 and 101, obviously. Three forms with special cases uh, for numbers between 12 and 19. Again, why not? Uh, three forms, special cases, one, two, three, four, unless it's one to 14. What? <laughs> and it goes on, uh, we've not finished. Three forms, special cases for one, two, three, and four. Uh, three forms with a special case for one and some numbers ending to in two, three, or four, but not all of them. And there's another one, and my favorite, six forms, which is Arabic. Um, and I, you know, I've read this so many times, I still don't actually understand how it works. I try and I put random numbers in and try and guess which form it is, and I get it wrong about 85% of the time. But basically, there's a special case for one and two, and then there's a special case if it ends 0, 2, or 0, 3, so like 102 and 103. And then there's a different ending for 11 through to 99, and I don't get it. <laughs> I am confused. <laughs> So, that was fun, and it taught me how little I know about the world at the same time. So, cool. So, we need a solution that can handle any imaginable rule, apparently. Um, 
including those ones that we have no idea how they work. So we kind of spent a lot of time looking at this and coming up with solutions. And when I, I mentioned earlier that Laravel's pluralization, the syntax gets very hairy because you have to write effectively regular expressions to define which form to use in which cases, delimited by pipes. We can see why that's going to be a problem. So we went, that's not what we're doing. That's not a good plan. So it's not the most straightforward, but we did decide to borrow get text's way of doing it, mainly because we know it works, and we couldn't understand it well enough ourselves to find an alternative. Um, it is complicated. The rules look like this. Um, but thankfully, there is a published list of rules for basically every language in the world, which we've linked to from our knowledge base and gone, look, when, if you're writing a translation for a new language, go and get the rule from there. It's fine. So that's what we did. Um, now we need a parser for these rules. I never thought I was going to say this, um, but Drupal came to our rescue. Uh, you know, I, I love Drupal. Um, I don't use it very much, but I never thought I was going to end up stealing code from it. But here we go. Drupal uses get text. However, like WordPress, it doesn't use PHP native functions, which means, quite handily, they have to be able to parse PO files, which, of course, means they have to be able to parse headers, which means they have to be able to parse plurals. Win. So I went into GitHub, da -da 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 -da, took their, found their, their code for parsing the PO headers, went in there, found the one for, taking, for calculating plurals, and ran away. So we have um, Drupal code to actually work out the plural forms based on the plural headers. Awesome. Which means we have something like this. Um, we have a rule that basically says you ha the, the base key should always be the singular, uh, just because it made things easy. But there are two forms in English. You have an item in your basket, and you have items in your basket. And then you just call a template function underscore p, thank you, WordPress, um, to provide that, and then it takes an argument for the length. And it will pass that to our plural rule parser and go, right, so I've got six. Which form do I need? And it will go, oh, you need form one. Oh, you need form two. And then you load that from the translation file, which I'll show you later. So finally, our first requirement is ticked. Only four to go. <laughs> As I mentioned, we wanted, um, to, we wanted to always ensure there was a default. What we didn't want to do is end up in situations where nothing got displayed, because that's horrible. And it's not the PHP way. We don't do that. We keep going regardless. Um, I know we don't anymore. It's a joke. <laughs> um, so we wanted a solution that would use the key as the fallback. In other words, we weren't using short codes. We would always, you know, worst case scenario, the thing that was the thing you were asking to translate is what you would get back. Um, but that was fine. It also makes templates more readable, because rather than that saying, like, title.continue or button.continue, and you being, what does that mean? It's quite clear. That's, that means, no matter what, you know, that says click here to continue. And you go, oh, well, that makes that really easy to understand. Happy days. It's not exactly difficult to do, because we go, oh, well, do we have this string in our translations? If we don't, we just return the key that we were given in the first place. Simple, right? We also wanted readable placeholders. Now, as I mentioned, get text doesn't necessarily do this, uh, which means it can make the placeholders' meanings quite oblique unless you have the documentation to hand, which I can tell you our customers often don't because, well, we haven't got documentation for some of it. <laughs> um, so that's fine. But again, by having those readable placeholders, again, you're making it really clear what this means. This is a translation. Are you sure you wish to delete item name from your basket username? Well, even without looking at any documentation or having the replacements there, it's instantly obvious what that string does. So that's what we did. And again, that uh, underscore underscore translation function, again, stolen from WordPress, thank you, um, can take a second argument, which has just an object of replacements. So we're going to replace item name with the name of the package, I'm going to replace username with the, the basket username. You'll notice that we don't use Blade templates, even though it's in Laravel. Um, we use Twig because no actual reason. Um, it's just a decision that was made way back when. So if, you are, if you're kind of moving to Laravel, but you're used to kind of, say, Symfony templating, there's an awesome, uh, a, an awesome package called Twig Bridge, 
that does exactly this. And again, we, you know, our do replacements function takes the string, an array of replacements, uh, if it exists, and loops through and replaces the placeholder out with the, um, the value that's there. And returns a string, nice and simple. We've now ticked off two requirements, or two and a half requirements. We're getting there, it's awesome. Per store customization, this was a big deal. The whole point of this is that we wanted the web stores to be able to control their own destiny, or at least their translations. Um, if they want to replace our default translations, if they decide that our German for welcome to my store is terrible, that's okay. They should be able to do that. That is their right. If they want to add custom strings, they need to be able to do that. Or, you know, they might even want to add a new language, as we said. So we thought about how we're going to get people to provide this data. And we settled on JSON. Now, it's not the simplest solution, of course, but bear in mind most of our, our uh, customers run Minecraft servers. They know what JSON is. They know how it works. Um, so we decided it was a, yeah, that was a reasonable expectation at that level. Um, and as I said, we wanted to be able to turn these in things into arrays so we could set them into opcache or whatever else. Well, doing it with JSON doesn't get much more straightforward. So that's what we did. And a translation looks something like this. You have a couple of meta headers, the locale, that plural rule, as we mentioned, the name of the language, and then your translations. And there's, a, there's one there with a placeholder and a plural. That's fairly readable. You can read that and go, I can see what those translations are. You could kind of quite easily add a new translation if you needed to. The only thing that's a little bit complex is that plural rule, which we provide, provide in the knowledge base. So that works quite well. And it's proven really popular. I mean, the first day we, we launched this feature, I think we had 300 web stores add their own custom translation on day one. Most of them were probably only adding one string. But the point is they could do it, and they could do it easily and quickly. But, as I mentioned, we only want our merchants to be able to replace one or two. If, if they have one new string, or they disagree with our translation for one thing, it doesn't make sense that they have to upload an entire file of all the translations to replace one thing. So we needed inheritance. Um, so it's quite straightforward. Every translation, and that's not working, awesome, provides a locale. So we can, quite, in quite a simple way, go, right, well, if they've provided their locale, if we have a translation that matches that locale, we can then kind of load, you know, have theirs inherit ours. So if they've got a string that doesn't exist, we'll use our one. So the control panel for that looks a bit like this. The projector's not brilliant, apologies. Um, but here, that's an ENGB. So it will use my, my ENGB translation first. If there's a string that I don't have, it will then go, oh, well, there's a default one here, ENGB. So I will then use the translations from that. That was quite an easy thing to do. So just a little fallback chain. We check if it's in their translation. If it's not, we check if it's in the parent translation. And if it's not, we use the base string. Simple. We've now ticked off all of these little requirements. I'm a happy man. Um, I, I, I think I pretty much did the, the, the truffle shuffle in the office. It was great. Everyone loved it. I'm showing my age now. <laughs> so one of the things we did say originally was that it needed to be fast. So how does this perform? You know, as a, at peak times, we do support, we do serve a lot of traffic. Um, Weirdly, on Christmas Day. Christmas Day is like a, a crazy day in Minecraft world. I have no idea why. I've got one web store that I think made like, in December last year, made a million dollars. And most of that was on Christmas Day. It was weird. Anyway, irrelevant. So yes, it has generated extra DB queries. Because each, each page that we load, we have to grab the translation file and maybe grab a base translation file. Two queries doesn't sound like a lot. But you know, if we're talking 60,000 page views a minute, that's 120,000 DB queries. That's not good. Um, but yeah, that's fine. Then there is some extra logic, a very small amount of extra logic, because we have to parse those JSON files. We then have to check whether the string exists in their, their translation object. And if it doesn't, check if it exists in our translation object, and yada, yada, yada. That also could involve more memory, because these translation files are quite big, and you're loading two of these big JSON files into arrays to hold for the, the, the generation of the page. But does any of this matter? 
Not really. I mean, the actual, the performance, we tried it, and even as it was, it was fine. It really wasn't making that big a difference. But it annoyed me. The actual DB cruise was a bit of a problem, um, and that probably needed fixing. The rest of it, I just went home and went, I don't like the fact it does everything twice. It made me grumpy. So I fixed it anyway. Um, that was quite easy. You know, we just basically merge everything and then cache it. Um, so you know, we know that the strings either can or can't match in two locales. But if we take our array and then we load those over the top, any ones it replaces is fine because we should be using their translation. And any it doesn't, it should use ours anyway. So we can do that. And we now have one array with, for the translations. Uh, we can then cache that. Um, so we just you know, store it as an op cache and everyone wins. And now we don't have to touch the DB at all. And we just, yeah, happy days. So we are now winning, finally. Except we're not winning. Because cache is my friend, except it's not. So we have external caches. Uh, we get a lot of DDoS issues because in the Minecraft industry, there's attacks going on all the time and yeah, whatever. Um, so we use Cloudflare to help with our DDoS uh, protection. And as part of that, they cache all the web store homepages. Someone hits a, a, a web store homepage, they cache it, which then means if anyone else visits it, they get served the cache for like two minutes. Great. And because this is kind of something that we've added on, we don't have separate URLs for each language. You can see where this is going. Um, so in theory, what happens is I go to a web store, I go, oh, actually, I would like this in German. I click the German option in the dropdown. It sets a cookie to say, we should be serving this site for this user in German. But if Cloudflare has a cache, it doesn't set the cookie. And even more fun than that is if someone had a cookie and then they visited that website first and there wasn't a Cloudflare cache because it had been invalidated, they get the site in German. Me, as a, someone who doesn't speak German, goes to the web store and I go, why is this one in German? Because even though it should be in another language, it's not. It's now in German because that's what's been cached. So yeah, we had some problems. So we said, Mr. Cloudflare, can we have some separate uh, cache, um, edge side cache rules, please? Now, they're written in Lua, which I had to learn. So there we are. Uh, but that's fine. So now we, in Lua, have a custom cache key, which is based on variables. We check if there's a query string, and then we get it to set some, or a cookie, and we use that in the, the, um, cache, the, the cache key. Uh, oh, and if they came from a query string, then we get Cloudflare to set the cookie on our behalf. Finally, now after all of that, we are now actually winning. You can see where this is going. <laughs> so, next question. I'm going to tell you that's a date. What date is it? Anyone? It could be the 1st of February, 2003. It could be the 3rd of February, 2001. It could be the 2nd of January, 2003. Or probably some other dates as well. I've got no idea. This was our first kind of mistake. Localization and internationalization is more than just language. You know, our first step was getting the language stuff sorted out because that's the most visible thing. But it doesn't stop there. It's much bigger than that. Um, so we have to look at things like handling numbers, handling dates and currency and, and things like that. So this is something that is an ongoing project. Um, the, the other stuff's live and we're now fixing this when we realize that we should have done it in the first place. Um, so we have some new meta headers. When you create your own locale, you can specify a date format. You can specify what the decimal point should be. So obviously in, in the UK, that tends to be a dot. Um, but in uh, Europe, for example, it tends to be a comma, which gets really confusing if you don't know which one you're using. Um, and thousand separators, which in some places they don't use them, so that can be an empty string. And then we provided a new underscore D function, again, copying the same kind of name rules as, as WordPress to format a date, and an underscore N function to format a number. <coughs> We'll probably take this further still. For example, being able to choose which side the currency symbol goes, because for some locales, the currency symbol would go after the number, and some it goes before, whatever. Uh, but you know, this is a, still a significant improvement. So now we are winning, except we're not. Which the fact there's still you know, 14 slides to go is a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> it's fine. Can anyone guess what this map shows? 
It's not, it's actually, it doesn't show too bad. Anyone fancy having a guess at what that map's showing? Different language speakers, uh, good guess. It's not, but yeah. What if I give you, oh, that doesn't show. Great. Well, I would give you those keys. What it actually shows is what payment methods countries use. Now, I, being a privileged white male as I am, assume that everyone used credit cards and PayPal. I mean, that's what we all use, right? Except it's not. Who knew? Apparently, lots of people. Anyway, so, yeah, for example, I can't read these. Um, for example, in Germany, they do, and in fact, a lot of mainland, man, mainland Europe, they do a lot of kind of bank transfer type payments. It's not like me logging into my online banking and doing it, but they have things like Ideal uh, and things like that that, that that they use for things like that. Um, you look at North America, actually, is mainly credit cards and PayPal, so that's fine, except Mexico, uh, where they do use credit cards, but they also have uh, cash-based methods, there's one OXXO, where you literally you get a code and then you go into a store and you give them money and, and things like that. Um, and, you know, again, bank transfer type methods are popular. South America, it's even more fragmented still. And in Asia, I have no idea. <laughs> there's, there's lots. There's lots and lots and lots and lots of different payment methods. So credit and debit cards are not global. And as much as they would try and convince you otherwise, neither is PayPal. Uh, and this applies double. When we look at our merchants' markets, which tend to be younger players, there's probably even less chance they've got a credit card. And you know, less they've nicked to parents or something. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something that, that we have to consider. Different payment methods are stronger in different areas. Now, one of the things we, we did is we spoke to our merchants. We went, hey, what payment methods would make your life easier if we supported them? Um, and we cheated a little bit. We found some suppliers that offer multiple payment methods. So I don't know if any of you guys have seen the, the, the developers from Molly have been walking around in the Molly hoodies for the last couple of days. We use that uh, because they support lots of kind of mainland Europe methods, pay safe card, ideal, things like that. Perfect. So that ticks a lot of boxes. Uh, other ones like Exola uh, because they, they offer more or less everything. Um, so this m gave our payment methods a much broader reach. Realistically, though, we cannot support every gateway in the world. For a start, I mean, our, our control panel is big enough as it is. If you went, pick which gateways you want from these 6,000, that wouldn't be useful. So we didn't do that. But what we have done is provide a way for merchants to do it themselves in the same way as the translations. So they can now integrate their own payment methods. They're not a first-class citizen in the same way, so you kind of have to go through the checkout and say, they can upload their own logo, and you go, yeah, I want that payment method, and then it redirects to a page where they can then have some JavaScript or whatever else to then balance it on. So it's not quite a slicker process, but it exists. Now, if you want to support Pago Facil in Argentina, or you want to support some other gateway that I don't know about in China or Japan or whatever else, you can do it. Um, as I said, they go through the checkout. They then, we then create a payment, but rather than it being completed, it's pending. We then provide a way for them to redirect, which could be a form or some JavaScript, and they pop in there. And then when the payment's completed and they presumably get some form of notification back on their end, we then have an API for them to check the payment so they can check that the amounts match and the currencies match and whatever else. And assuming that's fine, we then give them another API to say, yes, that payment's been completed. And then the normal fulfillment process that would normally happen from one of our gateways kicks in. So they can now integrate any payment method they want. This is cool. So, you know, we don't know everything. You know, I'm aware of this. Our merchants know far more about the people they are selling to than we're ever going to. We can speak to them, and we have phone calls with them regularly, but we're still not going to know everything. But what we were trying to do is reduce the support requests. If people can provide that information for themselves, and by extension, their customers can find that information for themselves, our merchants are getting less support requests. We're getting less support requests. And that goes for any company. If you're selling across the world, but your, web store, your website's only in English, you're going to have people that perhaps their English isn't their first language that will probably ask you questions where the answer is on the website, but not in a readily accessible format for them. You know, our solution is portable. This is one of the things for us. We do use Laravel and other things. Uh, but we might change that in future. 
And this same approach with these same layers of providing a JSON object or an array and then being able to replace them works in a spa, it works in a mobile app. Yeah. There are things that we still need to do. Error messages are still in English. Um, and as I mentioned, we want to look at currencies and the way our plugins work. Because ultimately, you know, with any web application or web service, the more usable the application is, the more successful it's going to be. But I think, finally, we can say we're winning. Thank you very much.